Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Stogie Geek Show, part of the Paul.com All Day Marathon for episode 350 in support of Wings for Warriors. You can go to wingsforwarriors.org. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Very excited to be on this edition of the Stogie Geeks. Which episode number is this? We got 70. Lo- 70. This is episode 70 of Stogie Geeks. Thank you. Mr. Mark Jr. is in the house to What's my up, left. What's up, Paul? Glad How's to be it here going, buddy? Hanging in there, man. Yes, yes. Uh, we're adorning the new um, Paul.com slash Stogie Geeks shirts that uh, we printed up with our patches and everything. Will, I have one for you. I'm going to send it. I haven't sent it out yet, but... They, they look sharp. I saw them on uh, Paul.com earlier. Yes, uh, thank you. These are real sharp. Yeah, yes. Well, you, Mr. Yeah. Will Cooper, thanks for joining us today. It's good to have you here, as always. Um... And we've got a very what do we let's talk about what we're smoking. There was a little bit of confusion as we had this big episode going on, and uh, we had some scheduling, um, not mix ups, but yeah, there were scheduling changes. It was a change, yeah. exactly. A sub. We, it, we we yeah we had to have a sub. Uh, we weren't able to get our original guest, but uh, Will is still kind enough to be smoking a cigar, Mr. Eddie Ortega, uh, who'll be in a future episode of the Story Geeks. Uh, so Will, why don't you tell us a little bit, <laughs> excuse me, about what you're smoking. I'm smoking the Ortega Serie D Natural. Uh, this is the number 20, which wasn't actually the size we had picked. Um, I just happened to grab the wrong size. This is the 6x60. Um, very good so far. Very good. Nice so uh, nice woody start to it. Um, I admit when I had some of the smaller sizes, I wasn't quite as big a fan, but, but actually I'm a little surprised how well the 60s starting off. <clears throat> Excellent. Now, Mr. Mark Jr., I handed you... Uh, in honor of our special guest that we have with us today, uh, who we'll introduce in just one moment, we decided to light up some uh, sticks from Roma Craft Tobacco. Sure have. As it were. So what, uh, what is the one you lit up over there? Uh, I have an Aquitaine uh, Knuckle Dragger, which I think is a 4.5 by 52. I'm or sure 4 by 52. Skip yeah, we'll let Skip moment. get into yeah. it. But uh, this has quickly turned into uh, one, of my, one of my favorites. To, and now, which which quite one, an awesome is this star. the um, Cro-Magnon? This is the Cro-Magnon. Yeah, in the same size, it looks like a. They're actually the same cigar. They have different wrappers, but we'll like skip. Get okay, to that. well let's skip yep. it. And I smoked the uh, Intemperance last yep. night. In that's the another one side. of theirs. Yep. Yeah, yeah, all great smoke. All great stuff. Yeah, uh, it, we pretty, have skipped. pretty pretty interesting, pretty interesting stuff. I'm excited to. Hear I, I've been having you know I've yeah. been having a lot of fun smoking. This is my my second one that I lit up. It's it's starting off very very nice, and I enjoyed the one I had last night. So. I, and I love these sizes, but we've actually got Skip Martin from Roman Craft Tobacco here with us. Say hi, Skip. Hey, what's up, guys? So, Skip, how did you uh, get started in the cigar industry? Well, we started from the bottom, now we're here, man. Yeah, <laughs> that song pretty much explains it for you, right? Yeah. So we, uh, I mean, like, I don't know how much of the story you want. So one day I bought a cigar in, in the Military Circle Mall in uh, Virginia Beach, uh, Virginia. <laughs> that was in 1990, uh, 92-ish, I think. Um, and now, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I guess I was a cigar smoker for for a long time, and uh, all of my time through the Navy, uh, I traveled a lot around the world and uh, uh, in, in corporate America as well. And um, when I started planning on getting out of corporate America. I wanted to work in the cigar business. I think like a lot. What? What's going on? What happened? We're having technical difficulties. Uh oh. You guys drop me. We Skip, did. We Skip, got you back there. now, though. You're back now. Sorry. Continue. That's okay. So, um, I you know I, I long story short, I opened up a cigar store. I did the cigar store for three years. Um, the cigar store was hit by a hurricane. Uh, in the process of, of you know, you know, planning to reopen the store in Austin where I actually live, um, I start. I wanted to start by making a cigar uh, that we could uh, that we could uh, sell in the store as a private label. I started working with Mike Rosales to do that uh, in Costa Rica. We we moved to doing it in in uh, Esteli and um, came out with a cigar. For, for my shop and then uh, you know it became very popular so we decided uh, to, to start the brand and it kind of just went from there now is one of your cur- current um, offerings was that 
originally one of the store exclusives or was that a different blend? Yeah, so the uh, there was a blend, and there's some old videos online about this. Uh, Doc Stogie Fresh had a thing on it, and, and Jerry had a thing on it. The uh, the Escaparati Liga 3-1, which was a, um, a Connecticut Broadleaf Maduro cigar that uh, I had purchased from um, Christian Aroa as, as, part, as part of a you know, 25 or 30,000 cigar buy that I of unlabeled kind of prototype cigars that were sitting in his uh, aging room. And it became one of the most popular cigars that I've had. And when we started blending what ultimately became the Cro-Magnon, uh, I was trying to replicate that blend and, and just wasn't successful to do it. And I, I think what we ended up with in the process of blending and the process of learning about the tobaccos, trying to match uh, something that I already enjoyed, uh, turned out I, I think we created something I, I liked more. And then um, <clears throat> the, um, you know, from there, you know, we sold at one point through Have a Cigar, we were selling, you know, um, I think 10,000 Cro-Magnons a month um, just just on, on, you know, our website. And then uh, we had a lot of retailers that had previously supported Mike through his, his brand who had asked to carry that, you know, the Cro-Magnon. And you know, we we let them know it wasn't a it wasn't a cigar to be carried for retail shops. It was it was just for me. And then um, you know, one thing led to another, and and we uh, decided to add uh, Intemperance. Uh, we worked on those blends, came out with those, and then uh, then came out with the Aquitaine. So, uh, Skip, now where where do the names come from? The names of the individual cigars, or yeah, the names of the brands? The brand Intemperance, Cro Magnet, and Aquitaine. So Cro-Magnon is uh, kind of came out of the fact that it, it really is about the the kind of culture of cigar smoking, and we were kind of sitting around talking about how you know we're about like a bunch of cavemen, but um, maybe a little more cultured than the you know the the first cavemen, and um, <laughs> just a little right. Then we had this whole four hour long drunk discussion about how the Cro-Magnon was actually the first early modern human and demonstrated uh you know the recording of history and tribal rituals and so then we started kind of working from that um aquitaine is the region aquitaine is the region in france where the cro-magnon overhang was found and um intemperance comes from uh, it's obviously it's the ob- opposite of temperance and the temperance movement is what started prohibition so um i think uh you know the the gist behind intemperance is you know this kind of modern uh temperance movement that we're facing in the united states against tobacco and uh you know it's kind of our you know cultural historical political statement against that so um so tell me a little bit about the cro-magnon blend what uh tobaccos make it up and uh, what was the blending process like so uh, you know, we started with the with the with the idea that we wanted to produce a, a U.S. Connecticut broadleaf Maduro uh, with a Lajero priming wrapper, and then uh, from there, you know, I, what I really wanted to explore was uh, you know the the uh, the filler leaf that was available in Nicaragua. Um, our, my partner in Nicaragua, Nico Sueño, is a guy named Esteban Disla, and one of the his favorites tobacco is a, is a Lajero leaf from the Dominican, um, the Alor region in Dominican, a Criollo uh, a filler leaf, like a native Lajero priming of, of a plant in Alor, the Alor region of Dominican. So you know we kind of started with Esteli Lajero. A really uh, texture, high in texture, kind of high priming um, Esteli Lajero, and then with that Dominican Lajero, and then we just kind of filled in the Viso and Seco from there, which are both also from uh, Nicaragua. What was it like working with the U.S. Connecticut Broadleaf uh, Maduro? When you know a lot of cigar smokers don't often um, come to recognize some of the uh, tobacco that comes from the U.S. Yeah, well, so a couple things. So, first of all, and, and, and I could be completely wrong, but based on my knowledge of tobacco, which is you know limited compared to some of the people in the business, but um, 
I think every strain of tobacco uh, that exists that I'm aware of, uh, at least in the Western Hemisphere, started from strains of tobacco, the nic nicotina tobacchiana that, that, came, that comes naturally from the U.S., from North America, from Central America. Um, one of the, the prominent strains in North America is the broadleaf strain, and for a long time has been uh, very successfully grown in, in the Northeast, in, in Pennsylvania, in Connecticut, River Valley. Um, I love that leaf because it's, especially in the Lajero priming, it's very thick and it's, uh, very, um, it's, it's a lot of flavor contributed to the blend. Um, but really what it contributes in the Maduro uh, fermentation is it, it contributes to sweetness. So, you know, that's always been one of my favorite uh, wrapper leaves. Going back to when I first started smoking cigars, it used to be a lot more popular than it is now. Um, but, uh, you know, recently what you've seen is a lot of people move away from Connecticut broadleaf until like Pennsylvania broadleaf or, or San Andreas uh, Maduro. But to me, you know, we were an American cigar and I wanted to kind of start with the idea that we could use some tobacco from the United States, one that was one of my favorites. I also felt like it did a good job of balancing out the pepper strength of the of the the Nicaraguan tobacco, um, and then the Cameroon was kind of a uh, was kind of it wasn't it was kind of like a hey let's try this kind of thing because I've never knowing the characteristics of Cameroon uh, you had the the spiciness from the filler you had the the sweetness from the wrapper and I wanted some of that kind of you know sour bitter um flavor you get from the uh cameroon and the specific cameroon uh that we found we found really cheap because it was actual wrapper leaf that had been yielded out from another factory that they wanted to get rid of uh without having to sell it as you know really cheap you know short filler so um you know it's kind of one of those things where the availability converged with, you know, what, with something I was looking to try. So, um, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting blend and, and, and honestly, it's so full body and by body, I mean flavor. I don't mean strength. It's not actually very high in nicotine, but it's so full body and the, and the, the bunch is so dense that when I smoke one, I feel like I don't need to smoke another cigar for a while. So really what I've, I've moved towards smoking more of the, the Atapadaka um, cigars blend that, of our own than I had of the Cro-Magnon. I usually try to kind of finish off of, or, you know, a big meal or, or kind of a day of smoking with the Cro-Magnon. Uh, but it's a, it's a great blend. It's still my favorite uh, in terms of, you know, all in uh, how we came to it. It's, it's, very unique. Uh, this is Mark. Um, I, I, I would like to ask you about how you came about the sizes that you chose uh, for your lines. They're not the sizes that you see typically uh, in the industry now. And uh, what, what brought you to those sizes that you chose? So um, it's probably not as, as complicated an answer as you would think. <laughs> uh, my, at the time, my favorite size was 5 by 56 in, in the cigar we were trying to replicate, I had smoked more of the five by 56. So that's what we actually blended it in. Okay. And then, um, Mike wanted a five and three quarter by 46, uh, Corona. And at the time I didn't smoke very many cigars under 52. So, um, I, I threw that one in there for Mike. And then, um, we did a six by 60, which turned out to not have enough flavor. So we doubled the Lajero proportions in the, in the blend, and it still didn't have enough flavor. It was very um, um, the the wrapper piece of it was diluted. So we reduced it down to four and a half inches because at the time the nub format was kind of popular, and I wondered, you know, what it would taste like if it was the same ring gauge but it was shorter, and it actually you know worked out. Um, and then the knuckle dragger. Uh, came from at the time I was traveling a lot in Europe and I was a real big fan of the uh, the uh, petite robusto format in the like the petite Edmundo and the petite Romeo and Julieta that I was smoking in uh, when I was traveling so I wanted a size like that and then the uh, 
I think that's all. The cranium was just because you got to have a Toro, right? So now, now, Skip, uh, I, I got to ask you about the size that you call the femur, which is listed here as a ten by one hundred and thirty-three and a third gigante. <laughs> right. But, uh, can Super you give us the, back, yeah. the background oh, behind that one? <laughs> yeah, so, um, I mean, this is well into, you know, the, the factory being on it, you know, on its way. And um, it, we really, uh, yeah, I was at a dinner. Um, I had had a lot to drink. I asked, I asked uh, one of the guys I was with was one of the guys who, who makes Florida Cana in Nicaragua. And, and I asked him if he would make me a um, a 15 liter bottle of Florida Cana just to kind of display in the in, in my house there in in, in SLE. Um, you know, I wanted to have the biggest bottle of Florida Cana in the world because at the time it seemed like a logical request. <laughs> and um, and he said that that was a ridiculous idea. And I started to explain to him it wasn't ridiculous because if you looked at you know double magnums of wine, if you looked at you know, these big um, kind of marketing display bottles that the vodka companies and everyone else has in the bars that, you know, it's it, it's a on one end, it, it's just kind of a it brings attention to that brand. So if you're standing in a bar and you're about to order a martini and you see a, you know, four foot tall bottle of of Grey Goose, then you're like, wow, I guess I'll take Grey Goose. Right. Mm. <laughs> but if uh, if you're in a steakhouse and you're about to order a bottle of wine and you see this big, beautiful bottle of you know, far niente and it's, you know, and it's, uh, it's just a work of art, this humongous bottle of wine that, you know, is just as good as the other bottle. Um, you know, so I, I thought, you know, if we wanted to have something to display in the, in the stores, I thought it would be really cool to create a, a really large cigar that would be kind of the, the cigar store equivalent of that display item. The only thing was, is like the bottle of wine, I wanted it to be the exact same, uh, type box, the exact same um, process of making the cigar, the exact same quality of the tobacco. I didn't want a, a big, humongous shape that was filled with short filler. Mm. And so we started to to figure out, okay, well, A, it's, we got to have a mold. So we found a guy who would make us a 234 ring gauge mold, but the but he couldn't make it more than 10 inches long. So the first one we kind of took a pass at, that one really didn't work out. And then um, I said, well, if 10 inches is the limitation, what is the proportional ring gauge of a 10 inch cigar to say like the mandible? And it turned out it was, you know, 133 and a third. So, um, um, we did a, a bunch of different tests to make sure that we could make it the same way that we make, uh, um, the mandible, including, um, we kind of developed this bunching process where two bunchers could bunch at the same time. Um, and there's a video of that actually on um, my Vine and on the Half Wheel Review. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a demonstration of of what, you know, kind of the limitations of making cigars that we wanted to kind of test. And then it's also just something cool to sit in the cigar shop so people go, wow, look at this cigar, you know, it's humongous. Now, you know, it's, it's a, is it a smokable size? I I thought I always said it was theoretically smokable, but I wasn't going to be the one to do it. Um, I, you know, there there uh, Brooks from Half Wheel did smoke it um, su- successfully, I would say, but uh, I don't know if I don't know if you would. Uh, I I don't think you can replicate the the physics of smoking a normal sized cigar. I think it's really important to the flavor profile to the blend you know, to the burn, I think it's important that you're able to create just the right amount of suction at exactly the right kind of intervals, uh, the way you subconsciously do when you smoke a cigar. I don't think you can do that on a femur. Mm. So I don't think you could ever really smoke it the right way. But uh, I think he did a pretty good job. Nice. Yeah, I, I like the size choices. Um, now, you have a lot of uh, event only or store exclusives. Is there a, What's going on, Coop? Is there a strategy behind that? Um, yeah, so Mike Rosales hey. just joined hey, us. Hey, Mike. Hi, Mike. How are you? Been hey, Mike. been blessed with my presence. <laughs> um, yeah, so we do have a lot of, of those things, and there's there's a couple of reasons. There's, the primary reason why we have uh, event-only cigars is is a couple of things. One, 
I like playing around with other sizes in the factory. Two, we didn't want to give away our core line cigars at events as freebies. So, you know, to incentivize people to come to events, one of the things that we would offer the retailers um, is the ability to purchase uh, with their discount, the ability to purchase um, these event only sizes so that if someone did come to one of our events, say like Outland Cigar or, or uh, um, Blue Havana in Chicago, that that they could uh, that they could purchase one of the cigars that they couldn't purchase somewhere else. Um, cause that seems to be something I think more and more in our, in our, um, you know, culture of cigar smokers that, you know, people are interested in trying kind of new shapes of the blends that they already enjoy. And particularly for, for cro Magnet and Aqu- for all of our cigars, because we don't change the blend across the different sizes, every size actually has a different flavor profile, Absolutely. meaning whatever the proportions are in, in the 5x56 Cro-Magnon, with the exception of the Mandible, which has more Lajero, it's the exact same proportions in the other, in the other four, in the other three, or four now that we have the mode five. So, um, you know, the Knuckle Dragger has the exact same proportion as, say, the EMH. So when you smoke the Knuckle Dragger, the, the actual flavor profile is different because the proportions of the tobacco are exactly the same. And the ring gauge changes the... Um, the the flavor profile. So when we make these event only size cigars like the Salomon for um, our field. for our field or or the uh, <clears throat> the the Atlatls or the Slavernockers, you, you get a different smoking experience with basically the same tobaccos, but you get a different experience. Um, the store exclusives are were really something that stores were asking us for because. Um, you know, they wanted it to be able to drive sales into their stores uh, using the, you know, the kind of core group of, of customers we've developed saying, hey, you know, if you wanted a box press, you know, um, cranium, you can go to Tower Cigar in Sacramento and they, they are the only people that sell that. Right. And that really kind of helped these retailers that are in these high tax entity uh, places compete, I think, against some of the things. Uh, and we didn't invent that. I mean, Tower Sicard did a VI. Yeah, um, a lot of manufacturers do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Smoke In is doing a lot of these kind of store exclusive type things. So, so Skip, um, um, I wanted to ask you about the Intemperance line. It, it looks like someone took a razor blade and cut off um, like maybe a quarter to half an inch of the wrapper at the end of the cigar. Is there a, is there a strategy? What's the strategy behind that for our listeners? I think I know well, what I want to ask you. Anyway. Yeah, so so it started. In, so what we call that is an exposed foot. It's you know as opposed to what you see like a shaggy foot. It's yeah. really just a little bit of the the foot that's cut, the wrapper that's cut back from the foot. Um, there's a couple reasons why we do that. One, when I'm when we're blending in the factory, I do that intentionally. I'll cut back the binder by about an inch so that I'm smoking only filler. I'll smoke. I'll cut back the the um, wrapper, so I, I'm smoking only binder and filler, and then when I get to you know maybe an inch and a half into the cigar, I'm smoking filler, binder, and wrapper. And, I, and the reason why I do that is so I think in some of the blends, the the wrapper is such an overwhelming flavor that if you're making small, when you're into the blending process and you're making small nuance changes in the in the filler blend proportion changes, it's hard to detect those changes. Um, easily if you're also at the same time um, getting all the wrapper and, and, and binder. So when in the cigars we use to blend, the, the first half inch is all filler, the second half inch is binder and filler, and, the, and the, you know, when you get to the inch and a half, it's all three components. So knowing that, uh, we also found out that the autoparaca shrinks after it's uh, drying, so because it's very hydroscopic. So the first wait, sample wait, we it's, grew, it's, we, hi- it's hydro what? Water. It's hydroscopic, so it's like uh, it absorbs and releases humidity very quickly. Gotcha. Okay. So when it's when you when it's wet and it's elastic while you're working it, um, what'll happen is is when you cut the end of the cigar to size and you put it into aging, as it dries out naturally it shrinks so it creates that exposure on the foot anyway and most people who work with autopodaca who know this who work 
a lot of people who work with autofaraca work with cooked autofaraca. So that so it doesn't have this effect. But when you work with natural autofaraca, it does this. And people who work with natural autofaraca would have told us that if we would have asked them. Mm. But um, what what they do is they actually wait until the cigars dry before they cut it to size for this reason. So when we found this, um, what 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 we talked about was hey, a couple things. One. Um, wouldn't it be cool if the consumer could smoke a little bit of the cigar, just get the, the filler and, and, and the binder, and then hit the wrapper and see the shift in the flavor? Two, the end of it kind of looked like the, the root system of the tree of intemperance that's part of our branding. And then three, we don't have to go back and handle and cut cigars if we close the end uh, with an exposed foot, because if it shrinks a little bit, nobody cares. Mm-hmm. Um, so all those three things combined we decided to start making the autoparaca that way and the intemperance that way as well. And then the last thing is at the time we didn't have labels on the cigars. So, um, it was an easy way for someone who picked up this cigar to see, Oh, well, this is an intemperance. I know from the end of it, uh, just characteristically, even without a label, this cigar, uh, is an intemperance. Very nice. Um, on the, uh, Aquitaine line, what was the, um, the driver behind the the strength profile the full strength and, and full flavor so um we went to so this is the way that happened we ran out of broadleaf i didn't know any better i thought you could just go to the broadleaf get in place and buy more <laughs> and so <laughs> so when mike and i when mike and i went down there um on this emergency kind of mission to find more broadleaf um we found out, oh, there's plenty of broadleaf to buy, but it's not going to be ready for a year. Mm. So at the time, you know, that was kind of at the point where Mike and I decided to form Roma and form Nico Sueño with Esteban. And, and um, at that point in time, um, I said, well, we need to make a, another line of cigars that we can sell when we run out of Cro-Magnon because we're just getting out of the gate here and we're not going to have a cigar for another year. So, A, we bought enough broadleaf where we'd never be in that situation ever again, and we've done so since. Um, B, we started looking at Ecuador Habano and Ecuador Connecticut because it's very readily available for the intemperance line. Ecuador Connecticut was a no-brainer. Esteban had been working on something for a long time on a blend for that, and and the first kind of sample he brought to, to Mike and I because he said, I have a really strong feeling on what I want for this. The very first one he brought to us was awesome. And then we said, well, keep working on it. And then I think after eight or nine different blends, we went back to the first one because it was perfect. Um, and, uh, and because he had been working on it for years. <laughs> so, um, And then uh, when we started working on uh, and then we slapped the Ecuador Habano on that blend and it didn't taste right at all. So uh, we went back and, and looked at some, some more Ecuador Habano. And what I was really kept being drawn to was the Lajero priming, the really dark, heavy Ecuador Havana. And um, I said, you know, this is great. Esteban said it's, it's you know, it's not very pretty. Um, I asked Mike what he thought. He said, well, it's not very pretty, but it tastes great. And I said, well, what's more important? Mike and I said flavor. Esteban said flavor. So we, we bought a whole bunch of this really heavy Ecuador Habano. So... Um, and by the way, it, it kind of a side note, the way we got pointed to that tobacco was because we were we happened to be in the in the warehouse at the same time as E.P. Carrillo. And he said, hey, I'm looking at Ecuador Habano, too, but there's this stuff over here in the corner that's amazing. It's just too heavy for me to use. So it kind of didn't hurt that, you know, Ernie had kind of put his seal of approval on this tobacco. So I was already kind of in love with hurt. it before I even uh, smoked it. But um so we, we started blending with that. And when I, when, I, when I went to Mike, I said, look, a couple of things. One, this is too heavy to be, to, to be um, fermented very quickly. So it's going to be the same problem we have with broadleaf. It's not going to be ready for another year. So why don't we take the 600 pounds we can get right now, put it on the Cro-Magnet blend, make a second Cro-Magnet blend, um, you know, call it something else, which we later came up with Aquitaine, and then use another different tobacco for intemperance that's more readily available. 
So we all agreed that that was a great idea because we had all this filler leaf for the, for the Crow Magnet blend, but no wrapper. So um, that tobacco just turns out to be very high in nicotine. And it's, you know, it's got a ton of flavor. So it actually ends up being a little bit stronger than the Cro-Magnon. Um, not, as, not as complex, I think, or not as full body, but maybe a little more nuanced, more complex and stronger. And then with the uh, Intemperance, uh, Jonathan Drew had told me maybe a week before, whatever you do, never use Brazil Atapadaca. Mm -hmm. So of course the first thing. So the, of course the first thing I did was I went to find some Brazil out of Paraca, and then I fell in love with that. So very cool. Uh, go ahead, Will. So Skip, there's a third uh, wrapper that you've played around with on the Cro Magnon, and that's the uh, Candela for the Formorian. Can you talk a little about that cigar and how that came about? Yeah, so, I mean, it's real simple. We, we, were, we had an event coming up in D.C. on the St. Patrick's Day weekend. I kind of mentioned to Esteban that everybody has these, um, you know, Candela cigars that come out that time of year. Um, I wanted something, I wanted something uh, kind of unique for this event because I real, I'm a real big fan of those guys, of, uh, you know, the D.C., um, the B&B Cigar Club guys, you know, Ashley and, and, and all them, Paul. Um, so um, Esteban went and literally just got, you know, five pound sample of this really, really great Candela leaf. And, and I'd always felt like Candela worked best on stronger blends, like really strong peppery blends. Like my favorite Candelas have always been like the Camacho uh, Monarch and the... Uh, the La Fleur, because it's this bitter wrapper, but it's on top of this really strong, you know, heavy blend. Um, so we made 10 boxes, I think, for for that event and ended up, ended up taking six of them to the event. And I kept four of them. Mike and I did. So um, I don't know if we'll do that in the future. Historically, Candela has a very huge place in American cigar market. In fact, it's called the American Market Selection wrapper because because it's it's so connected with the american cigar market and i think it does work well with heavy nicaraguan tobacco um i think the trick is is whether people view it as gimmicky or not because you know even though we've just talked about the femur and you know the event only cigars and the, i don't want us to be viewed as a gimmicky cigar company we put a lot of focus and effort on our core cigar lines um, but at the same time, if we have an event this March somewhere, we might put together, a, you know, five or ten boxes just to, to take with us. Skip, well, and that was on, go ahead, Will. And that was on one side, you did it with the EMH, right? Yeah, we wanted to do it with a larger ring gauge because but to, to dilute the, the, the kind of influence of the wrapper on the blend. Skip, what do you, uh, what do you have coming up next? You mean in terms of cigars or in terms of in terms um, of after, after this phone call, I plan on uh, eating lunch. Excellent, that's excellent. That's <laughs> great. What, what do you plan on having for no uh, for cigars? What do you have uh, in the works? Um, so the next thing, the, the the things we came out with a show were um, we came out with our first line extension for any of our portfolio. We've always had five sizes in Cro-Magnon and four sizes in Temperance. So at the show, we came out with. Uh, Mo 5, which is a um, 5 by 50 Perfecto in the Cro-Magnon blend. Um, at the Outland uh, Light Up Charlotte event, we announced and, and kind of previewed our first extension to the Autopodaca blend, which is called the uh, Breach of the Peace, which is a 5 by 56, uh, because people have been asking us for a larger uh, uh, cigar in the Intemperance line. So, the pair, the pairs for those sizes, the the Connecticut five by fifty six, which is called Brotherly Kindness, and the Mode five in the Aquatane blend, are both to follow also. So the the Aquatane Mode five will start showing up in a Perfecto sampler around Christmas, and it's going to have eight cigars, two Faith, two Envy from the Intemperance line, uh, two Cro Magnum Mode fives, and two Aquatane Mode fives. 
And then the brotherly kindness and the breach of the peace from intemperance are going to start showing up in in January or February after the break. That's excellent. So the only way you're going to be able to get that Aquitaine Move 5 right now is in the sampler pack? Yeah, until 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 the boxes start coming out in June and July. And I mean in January and February. And then one more thing we're working on is um We've we've been work, we've had this idea to come out with a a segundo or a short filler cigar um, that we're still working on um, called the the weasel, but we haven't really uh, we haven't really figured out how to do that yet um, the right way. So we're still working on that, and then we've, we we have a plans to start working on. We have bought the wrapper leaf and have a blend for the Neanderthal which is the, our new brand coming out um, hopefully by IPCPR next year. Yeah, what, what's is, is the that, Go ahead, Will. Yeah, I've heard. Is that a Corojo you're working with on that? Yeah, it's a really heavy, dark Corojo ugly leaf that we got from, um, from Aganorsa. But it, it has, it's like, it's like crazy, crazy flavor. And it's, it's got a lot of nicotine as well. So we're working on the underlying blend for it, um, tweaking that still, because what we're finding is, uh, even though it's crazy, super strong, you know, in week one, um, when we get out to like eight, seven, eight months, it's, it's attenuated a lot, the nicotine in the wrapper. So it's probably going to be our first line where, um, where, each individual Vitola will have a different proportion of the blend because of the, the, the way that the wrapper changes over time. So it's probably the hardest thing we've worked on since we started working on cigars. But it's probably easy for somebody like, you know, Jose Blanco, but for us it's tough, you know. <laughs> well, did you have any final uh, questions for Skip? I don't mean to cut it short. Of course, Skip, you're always welcome back. We, we focus very much on uh, your blends, which I think are uh, very unique and interesting, uh, right down to the names. Uh, so, Will, I didn't know if you have any closing questions for Skip. Yeah, and I know, I know we are, c- are tight on time, but there's one more line that you've launched, Skip, which I've had an opportunity to sample, and that's the Craft 2013 Limited. Uh, can you tell uh, a little bit about that real quick? Yeah, so Kraft is is actually our third brand, um, Cro-Magnon and Temperance and Kraft, and then Neanderthal will be our fourth brand. Kraft is is a is we came out with for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted to solidify the intellectual uh, property aspects of the word Kraft um, because because it's very synonymous with our business. And I and I started to hear more and more people stop using the word boutique and start using the word Kraft. I, um, which I never heard much before we existed, but it seems to be more and more common. Um, I don't think we invented the word, but I wanted to make sure we had the brand out there first. So, um, and then we wanted to kind of put a product out there that 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 represented what craft cigar making makes for means for us. The first size that comes out this year is called the La Campana de Panama Soberana, and it's a it's a Tobacchiato uh, figurato, so it's it's made without using a mold. It's 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 uh the name actually means the bell of Panama Soberana, and it's almost a you know a, tr- a trumpet or bell type hand bell type shape, um, and so uh, we are very proud of that cigar for a lot of reasons. I don't know if you guys can see. You got are we still on camera? Uh, your video is not showing up uh, currently. Oh, okay. So yeah, so it's it's a beautiful cigar, and I know Coop's got a couple of pictures of it, and um, but it's a very it's got ten different tobaccos in the cigar, and it's uh, you know it's not very strong, it's very nuanced, and it's got a it's got a, a sweetness to it that's that's unique to the other cigars that we have, and I think it's interesting because it's it's really there's nothing in this cigar that's not in our other cigars, but it just shows kind of how different different primings, different, um, different, uh, proportions, different use in different places of the cigar have a different impact on the flavor of the cigar. It's a beautiful cigar. I have a few pictures on Cigar Coop and you, you, phenomenal job on that. I really enjoyed that. Thanks, Brian. 
Okay. Excellent. Skip, thank you very much for appearing on the Story Geek Show. All right, man. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan of Coop and, and the, you know, I, uh, I don't know that very many people, I mean, maybe the half full guys are kind of very similar, but they have five or six guys. Coop, but kind of by himself, has always done very, very thorough uh, work on on his side. And then, um, you know, you're, you guys have always been super entertaining, uh, with the exception of this this segment here. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I'm just kind of worn out, man. I mean, I've been traveling so much. And, no, we, and, well, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a serious interview, but we had a lot of, lot of stuff to cover in a short amount of time. So, like I said, you're always welcome to come back, Skip. Bring you back another time and we'll laugh oh, more. Yeah. How about yeah, that? Absolutely. And drink yeah, I would rather sit in the background and just make fun of, make fun of Coop and – yeah. Great. That, that sounds great. So now we just got to exit. Excellent. Skip, thank you very much. We're gonna Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.